Welcome to the Anna Edu Show. The show, as I always say, that aims to bring you hope, to bring you joy, to make you feel like you're the best thing that ever happened to humanity. I've come across so many people this year, so many good opportunities, so many nice things, and so many people who are making things happen in various communities. It's not true what they say. It's not all bad news in the world. And not everybody is sitting back watching things go wrong. There are people out there who are making things happen. And that's what this show is about. To be that one voice in there that says, yes, there are good things happening in life. Yes, there are good people doing good things. This is our last show for the year. And I can't begin to tell you what a beautiful year this has been for me, for the people I work with, for friends, and for all the new people that I've met. People who know and know within themselves that the God that created them, created them for a purpose in this world. And they're not sitting back, looking at things go wrong. They're taking it and they're doing something about it. I can't complain. From women to men, to children, to boys, to anything, anything and everybody, even animals, I'm telling you, make me happy. When I see puppies, I start to cry. Why? because I see what's about to happen. When I see babies, I see what's about to happen. I see that if we plant something good in them, this world will be all the better for it. And so, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, don't give up. Don't give up on your dream. The God who created you is on your side. We'll see to it that things that you pray for and wish for, as long as they are good, will happen. It's this world. Today, I have two amazing women whose life story just, I keep going back today, thanks to Google and all that, it's easy to read up on people, and I'm a fanatic, a fanatic of good stories. So I have two amazing women with me today whose life stories, if you pay attention and listen, will tell you that nothing, nothing, nothing negative can put you down as long as you refuse to let it put you down. And so our first guest is lawyer Pam Pamalta. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm not going to talk too much. <laughs> I want you to tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Okay. Well, like you said, I'm a lawyer. Um, I'm also a professor at Ryerson University, and um, I'm the chair in Indigenous Governance. So what that is, is we work with First Nations on a whole range of projects, mainly related to governance. So mm -hmm. lawmaking, nation building, that kind of thing. Um, I'm a mom of two boys, one's 18 and one's 20. I have eight sisters and three brothers. I come from a huge, huge Ooh. family. I come from a huge <laughs> nation. It's the Mi'kmaq Nation. We all have huge families like that, mm -hmm. pretty much. Um, and it's pretty much all of the maritime provinces, which is part of our traditional territory. And I dedicate all of my free time and all the extra time to working on nation building for the Mi'kmaq Nation and for other First Nations across the country. That is awesome. That is so beautiful. And I was so glad when I read about you because I've always been curious about Indigenous people and you know, in a, we hear stories here and there, but we don't take our time to sometimes go into deep into what we see or what we mm -hmm. hear about people. And sometimes we just go by, you know. And that is why your story is so intriguing to me. So, you're, you come from a family of how many brothers and sisters? Eight sisters and three brothers. And where are you in this? I'm the oldest of the three youngest. So you're in the middle. So you had to fight <laughs> well, I'm like for your kind space. Kind of at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> you had to fight for your yes. space, <laughs> and you've been fighting ever since yeah. then. Ever since they placed you in that position, and you're making your voice heard, speaking on behalf of indigenous people and all that. And I have to tell you, I am so proud of your work, but I know that this kind of work takes a lot of courage. It takes no fear. It takes um, people to make it happen. What gives you the courage? Because I want people mm. to understand that doing such things takes courage. It doesn't come easy, but you can make it. Where do you get your courage from? Well, I think 
you raise a really good point because the thing about courage doesn't mean that there's an absence of fear. So I get scared to do lots of things, right. you know, because we know what happens in the world. There's a lot of negative pushback for people who try to make change for social justice. It's about just having the the strength to do it anyway, mm -hmm. to know that it'll be far better in the end and um, that doesn't come from me. I, I was raised in that huge family and all of my brothers and sisters were huge political activists. Okay. They were always on the protest lines, always negotiating with governments, always standing up for Indigenous rights and from the time I was really small they made me go to all of these things. Okay. So even when I was small and really scared and didn't understand why people were yelling, um, they kept putting me in those positions. Okay. And then as I got older in my teens and, and early 20s, they made me assume positions, um, leadership positions that I really didn't want to do, <laughs> but they forced me to do that so that I would build up a, a bit of a shield. I didn't know then that that's what they were doing, Right. but I know now that I got all the tears out, all the shakes, all the nervousness out when I was younger, okay. so that when I got older, I could do things like this and, and not let that stop me from doing anything. So it's really, it's really my brothers and sisters who kind of put me, you know, it's that sink or swim thing. Right, and they're right. like, here, you're going you're gonna to do that. So what, what you're saying, you didn't say it was the classroom no. or the, somebody in authority. It was your own family Yes. that built up that courage in you, that built the leadership skills in you. They knew it was scary. They knew it was dangerous, but they put you out there. Mm -hmm. That brings me to the importance of family. Mm. Because I see so many people suffer unnecessarily because they didn't have that foundation of, you know, because sometimes I, I see people that because their foundation was so shaky, going forward becomes scary, right? So, and then you said something about when you were young, you did all the crying, you did all the yeah. fearing. And <laughs> yeah. I've been saying to people that every child deserves a little bit of suffering. Yes. Would you agree with that statement? The reason why I say that is I look around me a lot and I see that children who had a, a little bit of pain, I'm not saying extreme pain, it took away some of their fear, therefore they become more courageous. And then when they add the classroom aspect to, you know, their mm -hmm. pain and mm -hmm. the struggles and stuff, it's like having both things to fight what society throws at Will you agree with that? Yeah, I think kids have to live the realities that other people live. So if you're only living in a privileged position where you're, you feel very entitled to everything and everything's provided and you're you live in a little protective bubble and you never get to experience what other people experience. How on earth are you ever going to develop empathy or understanding or compassion for someone living in a different way? And, right. and our family was very good about that because we were very connected to the indigenous communities. The elders were always around giving us advice and stories about you know, not everything's going to turn out your way mm -hmm. and sometimes you're scared for a good reason because right. bad things are going to happen, but it, the, the cause, the struggle, the, you know, trying to have social justice for Indigenous peoples, that is, is the far, ultimate. it's the ultimate goal. And if you think about it, you know, you get tired from travel or you have to do all of these things you don't want to do as a kid. Well, there are people that live without running water in this country in Indigenous communities, without sanitation, without food, without even shoes on their feet. So if we're a little bit discomforted by having to do things we don't want to do or going on a protest march, well, imagine other people. <laughs> exactly. So you always have to think relatively. Right. So when you say indigenous people, because mm -hmm. we're talking Canada, yeah. right? When you say indigenous people, what does it mean? I'm, I just know, like now when yeah. I say indigenous, I'm like Pat. So, <laughs> 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 right? But I, I think others don't understand yeah. what it means when you say indigenous people, because we're Canada, you know. Yeah, we're, yeah. We're Ottawa, and we're and it's multicultural, Alberta and it's multi and yeah, yeah. What? Why is it indigenous? Why the word indigenous people? Well, indigenous refers to the original peoples. 
So long before anyone ever came to settle here in Canada, there were indigenous peoples, so Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, Mohawk, uh, diverse nations of indigenous people living here with their own governments, laws, economic mm. systems, militaries, trade networks, territories. It was very sophisticated. Like in Africa. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. So if you think, okay. or in the United States, the same thing, or in New Zealand or Australia, right. indigenous nations, not just little bands, loose bands of mm -hmm. people, but actual nations, thriving mm. nations. And so th we use the term indigenous because it means the original peoples before okay. the settlers came. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. And so I read a lot about indigenous people suffering this and that. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? Like, I'm so curious. I want to know, because even today, I see people coming from all over the world. Mm -hmm. They come, they settle, and somehow they make it. And when I talk about they make it, they're able to get jobs, go to school, yeah. this yeah. and that. Yeah. And they thrive, at yes. least on the surface, you know. Why is it that indigenous people, I, I don't know too much, yeah. right? Why is it that there's... There are these problems that are so prevalent. You would think, being from Ghana, West Africa, you know when they talk about poverty, yes. the first place your mind goes is Africa. Is Africa, yeah. Right? So how is it that, because I'm curious, how is it that with all the services in place and mm. everything, that how, how does that happen? That's probably the best question. It's the question that all Canadians should be asking because of all the people who've come to Canada, every single immigrant, every settler, you know, whether they came a hundred years ago or today, they all benefit from the wealth and prosperity and programs and services and opportunities from indigenous lands and resources mm -hmm. that were stolen from indigenous peoples. Mm. So we were, we were thriving here for since time immemorial, Ridiculous. we had no problems here <laughs> in Turtle Island. <laughs> and then the settlers came and they had two primary objectives. One was to access indigenous lands and resources for themselves. And two was to reduce any financial obligations they had for indigenous peoples. Okay. And they did that with a two prong process. One was assimilation, so taking away their culture and language right. and things like residential schools. But the other more concerning one was elimination. So mm -hmm. they physically removed us with scalping bounties, forced sterilizations, um, high rates of death in residential schools between 40 and 70 percent. Um, they made it illegal for us to leave little plots of land called reserves. Mm -hmm. But then the rations that they gave us were about Nothing 60 to 80 percent to sustain a community and a, and a whole community can't live on 60 to 80 percent. Mm -hmm. So it decimated our populations by about 90 percent. Now that's the history part that people think is over. The sad part is, is that none of that is over. Um, there's still laws that restrict uh, First Nations people to reserves or they lose their rights, their treaty rights and benefits and that kind of thing. They're chronically underfunded. So the federal okay. government gives transfer for payments to the provinces, mm -hmm. but they have an obligation to also give transfer payments to First Nations. What they give provinces and First Nations are night and day. Sometimes it's as much as half mm -hmm. of what other people get, which is why you see First Nations without running water and yeah. sanitation, which in Canada, how can we have no water and sanitation? I am very, very curious. Like, I, I don't get it. I'm thinking, so where are the leaders in... Um, these places when their people are being sabotaged, yeah. when their people are not being given yes. work. It's the same question I ask of my people, my yeah. African leaders. What were they thinking when these people came and they were selling their children? Where are the leaders in these indigenous places? They're st I believe they're still in Canada. Oh, they are. There so are. So what happened? I'm like. So you take the. There's about 60 to 80 traditional indigenous nations across the country, and what Canada did by law was divide them up into small communities, relocate them, so that we couldn't collaborate and organize and defend ourselves. Yeah, because you they, were scattered all over the place. And they enacted laws so that even lawyers weren't allowed to advocate on our behalf. Um, they imprison us at, at rates that far supersede the Canadian population. So when we do speak out, 
we're more likely, the statistic now is our male youth are more likely to go to jail than ever get a high school, to, a high school diploma. So they're constantly taking our children. Um, there's 30,000 Aboriginal children in care right now. Some communities, that's upwards of 60% of all of their children. So we can't, we can't seem to catch up mm -hmm. and they're constantly knocking down our voices. Now we do have, of all these communities, there's 615 First Nations chiefs. Okay. And they do organize and they do speak out. When they do, however, they feel the wrath of government. So we've been speaking mm. out about these injustices. So what the government did was slashed our funding even more. Some of the organizations by 80 percent. I mean, so you can only do so much. We're, we're trying, which is why now the grassroots have decided to form together help our leaders and stand on the front lines and start organizing public information campaigns mm -hmm. and protests to say this is this is done you're not going to legislate our lives away anymore you're not going to cut our funding and steal the rest of our lands and resources right. there's enough here for everyone to share so are there indigenous people in parliament there are uh, there's a few uh, it tends to be problematic um, Why? Because some of the ones, especially right now in the Conservative Party, ran for their own individual purposes. So ladder climbing as opposed for the actual cause. So Harper is very strategic in using those mm -hmm. uh, specific individuals to advance very destructive policies against First Nations right. people saying, well, look, a First Nations person is doing it. And also, I think when a person steps up to the plate mm. and goes into Parliament and like we're saying, it's scary. It's very, and you have your family to raise and you've probably yeah. suffered so much before you got here. All you want to do is rest. Yeah. And you know, sometimes when you're trying to lead people that have been broken, it is so hard because they're tired and they mm -hmm. just need the mm -hmm. rest. So, and so with the work that you do, because I saw you on TV, then I saw you somewhere, then I saw you on a track in Toronto <laughs> and all <of> that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you hope to accomplish? Because every time I see that, I get, I feel hope for that young indigenous girl who is suffering somewhere, who feels like nobody's listening to her, who feels like she's a nobody. Because I think girls go through a lot. Girls suffer a, a lot, lot worse. So what do you hope to accomplish? I know you're not doing this just for indigenous people, but for everybody out there that is seeing mm -hmm. you, what is your message? What is your point? Well, it's really that we all have the power. It's, it's the indigenous citizens or any citizens of any state that are the decision makers. We've long forgotten that because politicians and leaders kind of usurp all that power for themselves. Mm -hmm. But you can see around the world when the people get together and start to actually exercise their voice and their power of decision making, then anything is possible and everything changes mm -hmm. and indigenous peoples have always been very we're very collective all of our rights and lands are collectively held and we think in kind of a collective nature so what we're trying to do is inspire that vision again we've had this long winter of of colonial oppression on our people right. and it is it's hard to decolonize right and we can't wait for everybody so while you know while that process is going forward we have to show that women can be leaders youth can be leaders mm -hmm. elders not just elected officials right and right. if the elected officials can't do their job for whatever reason then the people need to step up and exercise their governing You're power right. do does do ind indigenous people have their own language oh yes we have about uh, 50 to 60 of our own languages because each nation is different completely different wow. different languages laws governments customs traditions regalia everything this is beautiful is it being taught are the languages still being taught or has it been taken over by English? Well, this is, this is part of the problem. The residential schools put thousands of children in schools and beat them, sexually abuse them, and tortured them yes. if they spoke their languages. So a lot, a lot of our languages are in danger. Right. But by First Nations controlling our own education systems, we can introduce language immersion. We can make sure that culture is a part of everything we do in our schools. Mm -hmm. And with the government continuing to cut funding to those programs, we have to find other ways to do that to because no one else is going to save our languages. No. It's, it's we have to do that. And the thing about our languages is everything's in there. Our everything identity, is, is, our knowledges, our laws, our wisdom about how to protect seven generations into the future. So we have to save it. We have to save it. 
And so you're Associate Professor at Ryerson mm -hmm. University and Chair of Indigenous Governance. Governance. Yeah. So what do you hope to accomplish? Because um, Indigenous Governance at Ryerson is new. Yes. Right. Yes. So what, what is the point of that one? Well, what Ryerson did, they spent about six years trying to recruit me. They wanted to do more work for Indigenous peoples, okay. but they wanted to do something that would make a difference. So not just anything, but they, they wanted an Indigenous person to lead something at Ryerson, both to teach Ryerson students and faculty infuse more Indigenous knowledge, right. but also to work with First Nations communities, because as you know, in universities, instead of being a high-priced consultant, you can actually do research for free. You can work on partnerships for free, and it's about building capacity. Okay. So that's what they wanted, and they wanted it. Um, they, of course, they asked for my input when they, you know, recruited me, and I said governance. We need, yeah, thing. because we're moving, we're constantly working on nation building and being self-determining, and so we want to bring back our traditional governing systems. Beautiful. Well, Pam. I think I need about six sessions with you because <laughs> I'm not done with getting into yeah. really, really understanding yeah. what this is all about. Because I can relate it to the reason I asked about languages, the same thing yeah. with us. Our languages are disappearing. Everybody wants to speak English and not speak the yeah. language and things like so. By all means, we're going to have you back again. Oh, good. And we're going to work with you you know, to put out more information, to hopefully be a little voice in there Thank that you. is working to bring an understanding to Indigenous people and also to all people around. So thank you for coming to the Anna Edu Show with your spirit, with your energy, with, I don't know, but may God continue to bless you <laughs> and you. give you strength and the courage to keep bouncing from <laughs> <laughs> province to province, province, to province <laughs> as you make a difference you're going to go far Thank and you. so many people are going to be so much better because you stepped up to the plate ladies and gentlemen pam she's with us she's leaving us soon she's all over making a difference what are you doing to make a difference in your own small way see you soon